Good afternoon. So, there isn't a lot of uh, awareness of MIS. How many are uh, involved in commercial real estate? No? Well, there you are then. That's probably why you don't know about MIS. Okay, well, hopefully going to introduce some value to you this afternoon uh, if you're not in commercial real estate. Uh, MIS is... Um, the minimum energy efficiency standards. So, oh, here we are. This one. That's me. Uh, I'm a chartered surveyor and I've been involved in energy performance in buildings for about 10 years now. Um, and also uh, Bream, which fortunately I don't do because it's uh, a minefield and very expensive. And that's some of the things I'm going to talk about. I uh, work for a company called Arbonco and we're a software company uh, involved in prop tech solutions, um, monitoring the internal built environment, uh, well-being uh, and monitoring energy performance in a building as it actually um, uses energy so that you can monitor the energy use um, and see where it can be reduced. Um, we're also involved in compliance uh, software, uh, compliance with legislation the MIS legislation, which is what I'm going to talk to you about. So MIS's longer name is the Energy Efficiency Private Rented Property England and Wales Regulations 2015, which is incorporated in the Energy Companies Act uh, 2011. Uh, has anybody had any involvement with Green Deal, the scrapped initiative to um, improve energy performance in mostly domestic? No? Have yeah? Been you've, yeah, you've been involved with that, and the energy company's obligation, which undermined Green Deal completely by <laughs> making available free loft insulation and cavity wall insulation. Well, that was all in the Energy Act. Um, so whilst Green Deal is gone, uh, energy company obligations remains, and it's now in phase three. Uh, and MIS is part of that, so it's part of uh, UK law. MIS uh, came in as part of the Energy Performance in Buildings Regulations 2012, which was born out of the Energy Performance in Buildings Directive, uh, which was an uh, EU-wide um, uh, programme to reduce the energy performance in buildings because of the amount of energy that buildings use. Um, and whilst it is an EU directive, um, the major partner in that um, was BRE, the Building Research Establishment. The UK is the, ma one of, is the, the main driver in Europe um, for, for directives related to building regulations and energy performance, even though actually um, uh, countries like the Netherlands and Germany and France generally have much better performing buildings than we do. So MIS has been incorporated, as I said, in the um, Energy Companies Act 2011, so it's it is in uh, UK law, so um, it, it did cross over with the Great Reform Bill, although obviously we don't know quite where that's going. EPCs, which is effectively um, how MIS is measured, uh, come under the Department for Communities and Local Government, which is now called the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. And that's a bit of a problem for MIS because MIS falls under BASE. Now that's a problem because BASE have chosen to use um, MHCLG's methodology for assessing energy performance in buildings and that methodology is completely flawed. One of the things you've got to say is, or understand is, the relationship between an EPC and energy performance is at best vague. An EPC is not an indication of energy performance. It is an asset report based on a snapshot of what an assessor sees on the day and what uh, the software, the national calculation methodology generates for that particular building, whether that be a domestic building, a dwelling or a non-dwelling, non-domestic building. 
You can have buildings with a, an A-rated EPC, which perform dreadfully, and you can have buildings with a G-rated EPC that perform very well, because it all comes down to how a building is used. You could have a, a, a building built, an Edwardian building, with an electric heater and a tungsten light, and it will have a dreadful uh, EPC rating, because uh, the model will assume that there's a great deal of heat loss out through the building fabric, particularly um, the joins in the building. 25% of heat loss through a building is through the, through the joins in a building as much as it is out uh, of the, the roof um, and the walls and the floor. But because that building isn't used very much and those electric heaters aren't turned on very often, it actually won't use much energy. But you could get an all singing, all dancing building uh, with ground source heat pump, etc., etc. but it's occupied all the time, it's going to use far more energy. So the EPC is just an indication um, of the potential energy performance, not reality. And the reason that there's a problem uh, between base using EPCs is it's an imperfect measure, but also um, EPCs have to follow certain conventions, assessors have to do things in a certain way. Um, and particularly in the retail business, this has caused um, a lot of uproar because when a building is empty and it's just in its shell form and everything has been stripped out, which um, retail industry likes to provide buildings so the fit out comes in, an assessor has to assume worst case scenarios. So they have to assume uh, it's got uh, direct electric heating, tungsten lighting, and invariably that produces an F or a G rating. And that's a problem because you're not allowed to let buildings with an F or a G rating. So some of my clients like M&G Real Estate, uh, TH Real Estate, British Land, don't like that very much. <laughs> and my job is to try and help them uh, get through it. So I'll take you through some of the key information on MIS. So MIS, there is a minimum requirement to achieve an EPC uh, score of 125, which is a band E rating. That's the threshold for a band E. But the legislation encourages property owners to go beyond that um, and look to maximise the potential EPC rating. So hopefully that will bring it up. From the 1st of April 2018, all private rented property, dwellings and non-dwellings, was required to have um, an E rating before it could be let. Um, and the legislation also includes lease renewals, but I'll explain why that's not very clear later on. Um, you won't be surprised to learn that the legislation is not very joined up. There are some major issues. And then the really big one is uh, in 2023, where all passing lease agreements must um, currently achieve an E rating. Um, so uh, if the lease was commenced before the Energy Performance in Building Regulations first came um, into force in 2008 um, and it didn't require an EPC in 2023, one will require to be um, commissioned um, and it will have to comply with MIS. So take you now through some of the um, requirements of MIS. MIS requires that uh, improvement measures must be self-sustaining within a deemed period of seven years and it's a discounted payback seven years. Um, that is a hangover from Greendale but also from Building Regulations Part L2B which um, indicates that um, renewable energy systems, whatever they may be, uh, can only be used to gain Part L2B consent if the payback is less than seven years. So seven years is a recurring number uh, in this legislation. And it is a discounted payback and uh, that's the uh, equation that you have to use to calculate it. So uh, I won't leave that on screen too long because <laughs> I'm distracted. <laughs> there are some exemptions. Firstly, there's the Energy Performance in Buildings Regulations exemptions, and then there's the MIS exemptions themselves. So if we start with the Energy Performance in Building exemptions, 
first one at the top is one of the most controversial listed buildings. A lot of people think listed buildings are exempt and it absolutely is not the case because an EPC assessment is a non-invasive survey and therefore it's not going to impact on the building and therefore there's no reason it can't take place. Also, there are almost no listed buildings which aren't capable of some energy performance improvements. A lot cannot and should not be done, but there is always usually something, uh, even if it comes down to just changing uh, some of the lighting systems. So listed buildings are not exempt <coughs> from the energy performance in building regulations. Temporary buildings are exempt. Um, since we're on a golf course, a good example of a temporary building is, say, at the Open Golf Championship, they put up a virtual town, um, but they're only there for sort of three, four months. Those type of buildings are exempt. There are some products from um, uh, the Nordic countries, temporary warehouses, which um, can usually up for a couple of years, but then are taken down and they're considered temporary. <coughs> in England and Wales, places of worship are exempt. In Scotland, they're not. Uh, that's because in Scotland they recognise that places of worship aren't used for places of worship very much and tend to be used for daycare, um, either for um, retire retirees of the older generation or for predominantly children. Low energy buildings. Um, this is quite a controversial one and I'll come to the more of this later. Uh, low energy Low energy buildings, that's like barns or, or storage areas for tractors, um, but it, recent changes in the EPC conventions have, have changed the definition of that somewhat. Detached buildings under 50 metres squared and they must be detached. Um, that does come up more than you might think. Buildings due for demolition, so if there's a genuine um, intention to demolish and there is the consent to demolish, that can be an exemption. And um, properties that don't have a conditioning, but that's caveated by the fact that they don't need to have conditioning. So if somebody's working there uh, for more than 30 minutes at a time, then uh, there is a duty of care requirement for that building to be conditioned. So that, just because it doesn't have any heating, doesn't mean to say it has no conditioning. So that's remote storage spaces, uh, where there's no <coughs> requirement for conditioning, they can be included in that. Um, but it also includes um, owner-occupied properties, like some workshops, uh, where, where they don't, where they might have the, do the doors open all day and they wouldn't have the heating on. But um, there's a recent uh, change in the conventions which provides the opposite of clarity on that. Yeah, so here it is. Uh, low energy industrial buildings. EPCs have to be completed in accordance with conventions um, determined by the Ministry of Housing and Local Government. Uh, those conventions started in about 2010 um, and have gradually got more and more complex, um, which gives you an indication about EPCs as well because uh, when they first started, people went off and did a course and then we started going out and doing assessments on buildings and they're uh, generally pretty rubbish uh, because there was no guidance and it depended on which instructor you had and what they told you. Um, so then they started to standardise the system um, and, in, and determine how you should go around assessing a building and modelling that building. And as each time they've introduced new conventions, um, it tends to make the EPCs that preceded those conventions <coughs> obsolete. Uh, one of the major ones is com called Convention 6.11, which says which parts of a building can be considered unheated, whether or not it has heating. So there are certain areas, so originally if you had an, an office space and it had no heating in it, you could say it was unheated. Now you can't. Um, and they gradually expanded that list, and last year they expanded it to include toilets, which is an interesting one, because if you had a workshop with a toilet in and a, and, a, and a panel heater, then that would need an EPC. If it had an office and it had no heater, it would still need an EPC. But if you took that office out and said it's just a workshop, you could now ignore the heating in the toilet and then you could put a shed inside the workshop 
and heat that, and it wouldn't need an EPC. So, MIS exemption scenarios. First one, obviously, is if they're exempt from the Energy Performance and Buildings Regulations. Makes sense. Self-sustaining payback, so each individual measure that you could improve the building by, as detailed in the National Calculation Methodology, and there usually there's about 20 um, various improvements you could make. If none of those uh, are capable of a payback in seven years, um, you can get an exemption, or you can dismiss the ones that don't. You can't um, do anything that would uh, impact on the integrity of the building, so listed buildings, coming back to that, a lot of listed buildings need to breathe, um, and if you start putting insulation in, you start uh, encouraging dry rot and all sorts of other issues um, which need to be avoided. Um, as an aside note, the energy company's obligation of putting all this free insulation in roofs and, and walls um, in buildings that should not be insulated for all sorts of reasons, particularly wind-driven rain, areas of high exposure. Supposedly the new products have a vapour control layer, um, but I'm sure we're going to see over the next few years um, a lot of issues with that and insulation being pulled out where it should never have been installed, um, but it was encouraged uh, under the energy company's obligation to do so. Um, internal air quality issues, build-up of funguses, there are all sorts of reasons why buildings shouldn't necessarily be insulated if they haven't been designed to, to be insulated. If you can't get planning consent or listed building consent, uh, but you must show that you've tried. If you're a new landlord, you can get an exemption, uh, but you have to be a new landlord, it can't be an intercompany transfer, but that's only for six months. If you can't get third-party consent um, in real estate, often you find that there are many different vested interests and to do certain things you'll have to get all those consents and if you can't get consent from everyone, you can look for an exemption. There's a curious one which somebody, again, this is part of the curiosity of legislation, has thrown in that if you get a 5% drop in the value of a building from improving its energy performance. I think of anybody has ever, in all the presentations I've done and do a lot of these, no one has ever come up with an example of how that might happen. Theoretically, I suppose, if you put on solid wall insulation and, 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 and destroy the aesthetic of the building, that might be an issue, but you probably wouldn't get planning consent in that case, so where that's come from. Um, and then, uh, where all the improvements you can make, uh, and the rating is still below an E, uh, or there are no improvements that will achieve an E. All exemptions are temporary, either six months or five years, um, and there's a reason for that, and I'll come to that more a little bit later. Uh, that's because new technologies may come available, the calculation methodology may change, and most of all, energy pricing changes, and changes the, w the calculation. Energy prices go up, um, new technologies become more viable. All exemptions have to be registered on, on a national database which is open to the public. Um, and those are some of the, inf uh, or that is the information that's required to be put on uh, the database. And that can be scrutinised by anyone. Um, and we'll see in a minute why that can be a bit of a problem, albeit uh, not aware that uh, much of that has taken place at the moment. So before I move on to some of the uh, risks from MIS to commercial real estate, um, just let you know about some indirect legislation that's uh, connected to it. First one is the Companies Act 2006. Anybody come across that? The Companies Act requires all listed companies to report their climate change emissions on an annual basis and directors must sign it off. A colleague of mine, um, and I'm not sure I agree with him, but he's far more knowledgeable than me, he thinks this is a very significant piece of legislation because it requires listed companies to report their climate change emissions and in turn they're going to pass that down the chain. But I do know that that does happen with, say, Rolls-Royce in Derby, that their suppliers have to report their 
climate change emissions uh, in turn and there is evidence that suppliers to companies caught by this uh, are looking for carbon reporting. Or I shouldn't say climate reporting now, it's a bit old hat now, carbon, it's climate change emissions, it's the spread of emissions. And then uh, we have landlord and tenant legislation, the 54 Act, um, and I'll come to more of that later, and the 27 Act, dilapidations, tenants improvements. Um, and it is particularly this one which is causing some headaches uh, in the, in the uh, commercial real estate sector. <coughs> still, still awake. <laughs> So, MIS, risk. MIS represents risk for a number of reasons. There is the, there is the legislative risk, uh, the penalties, and then there is the impact on the other legislation because the MIS legislation is not, is not joined up. Oh, go back one. So, those are the... Uh, Penalties associated with non-compliance. Quite a lot of money. And the thing to remember is if you had a 10-storey building and every storey didn't comply, it would be 10 times that. So it starts to become quite a lot of money. Now, the government actually isn't that keen on using the statutory penalties to ensure um, enforcement of MIS. What it's hoping to do is that the scale of the penalties will encourage um, the legal industry and the, and the financial industry to make sure that there is compliance. That's, that's the main driver. Although that being said, MIS um, penalties can be collected locally, so there is the opportunity for local authorities to study the exemptions register um, uh, and, if, and if there is um, a breach, um, they get to keep the money, the local, the local authority gets to keep the money. But that's not the main intention. Uh, the idea is that financial industry and, 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 and the legal industry will ensure that there is um, compliance. There are some uh, legislative elements. Guaranteed energy price increases. There's a lot of talk in the press about energy prices being um, capped which is absolute nonsense because the energy companies have been promised there'll be increases because how else are you going to pay for nuclear power stations and wind turbines and much else. So whilst in the press there's one story, the reality is there's going to be energy prices increases. There has to be to pay for new, uh, new technologies. Um, not supposed to put that one up quite like that. There is a lot of discussion that the minimum uh, performance standard will be increased to a D by 2022 and to a C by 2026. And one of the accreditation companies, Elmhurst, is saying on their website it'll be a B by 2030, which I think is pretty unachievable, actually. Um, but those are the numbers being talked about. And there's also talk about a change of emphasis uh, from emissions to energy use. Uh, like I said before, EPCs are all based on carbon emissions, but the reality is, um, it's now been recognised as there's all sorts of other emissions they need to consider as part of climate change. Okay, one of the other uh, risks from EPCs I've alluded to earlier is the fact that um, since it started in 2008, there have been 27 issues of the base building energy model called the simplified building energy model. Um, and each time it changes, the EPCs or the EPC rating changes. Uh, so you take uh, something that was modelled in 2014 and put it into the latest version and you'll get a completely different rating. Um, actually, if you run the rating one day and then run it the next day, you'll probably change as well because the software is very strange. Um, and because of MIS, you're seeing an increasing use of dynamic simulation modelling. Has anybody any idea what that is? Okay. Simplified building energy model is a very simple um, program where you put in the building fabric, you put in the area of every fabric, uh, mm -hmm. the walls, the floor, the, the ceiling, and divide a building up into its various um, areas of, of use, um, and then you put in the conditioning system and the lighting systems, 
uh, one or two of the bits and pieces and it produces a rating. Um, one of the main aspects of it is the weather data. It has monthly weather data across England and Wales depending on where the building is. Dynamic simulation is the same, all of that, but it goes on hourly weather data. So uh, it gives much um, greater accuracy in terms of the energy the building will demand throughout the, throughout the year. So in the southeast, you're going to get more cooling demand. Um, and in, the, in the Scotland, you're going to get more heating demand. Uh, generally, um, dynamic simulation is considered to be more accurate. Um, but um, it's still based on theory. And theory and reality never match up in energy performance. And what you're seeing is very simple buildings, dynamic simulation being used to get round the MIS because you can get a better rating sometimes from dynamic simulation, sometimes you get much worse. Conventions have changed, we're now in the eighth version of conventions and each time they change, it changes uh, the EPCs before it. Um, and there's very little oversight of EPCs, so there's a lot of rubbish. Uh, only 2% are lodged. Um, and uh, if you're not caught by an audit, mistakes can go through. So there have been some big changes in conventions. The first what big one was uh, buildings relying by use class, which made a big impact. Um, it, could, it wasn't just a subjective choice. The one I mentioned before, uh, zones and what their use is and whether they're heated or not, um, and the use of dynamic simulation which used to be prohibited for simple buildings and now is permitted. So what's the impact of all of that? Well, a study we did of a British land portfolio, 14% of band D ratings dropped to an F, 19% of E dropped to an F and G, and 33% of D and E dropped to an F or a G. So significant impact. And that assumes no data enteros. So it could be even worse than that if the models were inaccurate. Right, I'll now move on to my pet subject, landlord and tenant. Any familiar with landlord and tenant law? Yeah? Good. Well, may maybe you can uh, teach me some things in this one. So hopefully we'll get a bit of interaction because the first one, first part of this is quite dry. Hopefully this will um, provoke some thought and discussion. One of the things you're starting to see uh, in new leases is clauses dealing specifically with MIS. Um, <coughs> one of, I spent many, many conference calls with, with a major client of mine discussing um, lease clauses to do with MIS, so restricting what the tenant can do. Um, and lots of other uh, major landlords are introducing these clauses uh, to restrict the what the tenant can do um, because of the implications. They don't want to get a building back that doesn't comply, um, so they're going to say to the tenant, you must make sure this building complies with the legislation. But there are also obviously implications later on um, for rent reviews. Uh, and one of the reasons these are there is because often uh, the dilapidations, um, uh, landlord and tenant doesn't provide for necessarily MIS um, and also protecting the landlord from what they get back. So to give you a case study, which is always the best way to illustrate this, not that building, but this is. But the, the left-hand side is what actually happened, but the right-hand side is not the actual building. Um, so a tenant removed a mezzanine and um, combi condensing boilers, which were heating some, um, some offices. Um, because they altered the floor area, the EPC was no longer valid, so a new one was required. Assessor came in, had to follow the conventions, worst case scenario, and the building suddenly was an F rating couldn't be relet um, because the landlord didn't act quickly enough to say no leave it as it is they have to then remedy the building got to be careful what you take back from the tenant uh, if you get back a building with a different floor area to the one on the EPC a new EPC is required and that EPC could be worse uh, than what preceded it so that's why clauses have been putting leases to protect against that scenario so rent review, uh, 
Rent review, assess rent review surveyors here? Yeah. So in rent review, you have certain assumptions. Uh, you assume the lease uh, and the rent review clause don't exist. Um, so you've got a willing uh, seller and a willing purchaser, and the building is vacant for immediate occupational use. But MIS regulations say that if it doesn't achieve a E rating or better, it's not fit for immediate occupational use. And there's case law that backs that up. Lawyers seem quite <coughs> relaxed about this, but we'll see. Uh, occupation by the tenant is disregarded. And the tenant's improvements are disregarded. Well, that's important because of the tenant's put in systems that make it comply with MIS legislation. Um, and, in e and, and then says, oh, yes, but if we take this out, it's an FRG rating. Well, what's the rent then? Well, you can't rent it then. So what's the rent? Zero? Maybe. Possible. So those are some of the questions that arise from that. Well, I might see that. The rent should be zero. You can't let this. And you'll see that scenario again later. So what happens here in this scenario? Um, the EPC model is incorrect. It's got some wrong assumptions. We see this building here. doesn't have opening windows. Um, so it needs mechanical ventilation. I've actually come across this exact example in Manchester, a building, non-opening windows. Look at the EPC model, no mechanical ventilation. It's got to be wrong. That would make the EPC rating falsely good. So the tenant dismisses the comparable evidence. Say a floor comes up to rent, can't be rented. If this building had just been bought by an investor, and all of a sudden he can't rent it because the value hasn't looked at the building energy model to see if that's correct, who's he going to call then and say, well, hang on a minute, I've just paid all this money for a building I now can't let because it's not, it's not compliant with MIS legislation. So you've got to know whether the building energy model generates an EPC is correct and stay on top of that because there could be major implications. The one I worked on in Manchester has been, been sold for 16 million and the building energy model wasn't compliant with the conventions and it had some, uh, one area of the building, 17% of the building, they had a, uh, an efficiency rating for a cooling system of 1,250%. At best, that building was going to be an E rating and probably, uh, probably an F and they've just spent 16 million on it and they might not be able to relet it without spending a lot of money. <coughs> tenants' improvements. Tenants are entitled under 27 Act to compensation for their improvements. So how do you measure that? Take away their improvements and you can't let it. How are you going to quantify that? That's something that uh, the lawyers in London, at least, are, are, are quite concerned about. How are you going to, how are you going to quantify uh, the value of a tenant's improvement? Because... You, all sorts of issues come into it. Well, what's the rent? What did it cost to install? So are you referring to reinstatement there now? So at least end, where the improvements are made, which meet the criteria. So the landlord says, well, I want this out, which means you can't let. Is that what you're getting? Well, no, it's the other way around. The tenant's saying, you can't let this without this improvement. I want compensation oh, for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah? yeah. So... You could come to a review or a lease renewal review and he says, well, yeah, but your building can't be let without this improvement. So, or, or if I'm moving out. Service charges. What if you have a 10-storey building and the top three floors can't be let because they're an F or a G and you need to replace the conditioning system? Can't take that out of the service charge disrupt the tenants below in their existing lease. There's compensation issues. So service charge is only for maintenance. So if the tenants were able to show that you'd replace that conditioning system to make the rest of the building lettable, they're going to come and say, no, no, I can't do that. Dilapidations. The 
Settlements can only restore pre uh, premises to equivalent condition at the date of entry. That's what the dilapidations law says. That's uh, the top one, the damages for breach of a covenant or agreement to keep premises in repair during the currency of a lease or put premises in repair at the termination of the lease shall in no case exceed the amount by which the value of the reversion in the premises is diminished owing to the breach. What does that mean? And I'll show you an example in a minute. Um, so the outgoing tenant is not required to put the building back in a condition that's compliant with current legislation. They're only required to put it back to what it was when they took occupation. So you get this building. So would the dilapidation settlement be zero if restoring it to what it was in 1980, if that was built in 1980, is there an F or a G rating? Prior to that, they may have said, well, we've got a settlement of, say, £35 a square foot. And then somebody looked into it and said, actually, if we do all that, you won't be able to let it, so why are we paying you £35 a foot? Let's leave. That's a very, very real scenario that's causing a lot of headaches, both uh, in England and Wales and in Scotland. Anybody thought about that scenario? Obviously, you're yeah, thought it, about it. it. It's come up already, yeah. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Uh, I was teaching to a colleague a couple of weeks ago at one of these and he was asked to do a valuation and he valued a building at zero. He said, well, it's not compliant. Its value is nothing. What about uh, other issues um, of vacant possession? You, I mentioned earlier, you get the building back and the floor area is changing, you need a new EPC. What if the subletting, various issues there? There could be all sorts of issues. You've got to know what you've got because the guidance says a change in floor area requires a new EPC, modification of the conditioning cream, new EPC. The one's quite controversial uh, in the sense that uh, it says that you can replace the entire conditioning system and you wouldn't need an EPC, but you'd still need part L2B compliance, which would require an EPC. So just an example of how disjointed the legislation is. Release renewal, this is quite a controversial one. Kind of slightly in the, the, the wrong order. Um, but if we start at the bottom, uh, the guidance for a non-dwelling EPC says not all transactions will be considered to be a sale or let. These will include lease renewal. However, the MIS regulations says it applies to extension or renewal of an existing tenancy. And the energy performance in building regulations say an EPC has to provide for any prospective buyer or tenant. So there's a lot of contradiction there. A lot of people, a lot of assessors say, yes, the, the guidance says this, uh, therefore you don't need a new EPC on renewal. But actually the legislation says you do. You do. The MIS regulations, since the MIS regulations came later, you might be arguing saying that's superior because it's a later piece of legislation. Lots of arguments over that and you'll get a different perspective from different assessors. I used to be uh, unsure and now I'm not so certain. <laughs> <laughs> I generally uh, advise my clients to take a precautionary approach and say, well, could be this, could be that, just let's just revisit it completely uh, because that's the only way to approach it because you don't want to end up in court challenging this. 54 Act. Uh, again, um, anybody familiar with the 54 Act? So, uh, 54 Act renewal, the tenant's protected, um, but if it's non compliant, whilst it's protected, uh, you have to give the, the tenant a new lease, but it will still be illegal under MIS. So, you can be, you, you're required to do another 54 Act to give a new lease but your property is still illegal, so you're still going to have to make it comply. Um, fortunately, tenants can't turn around and say, oh, no, I'm going to quit this lease because it's non-compliant. They can't use non-compliance with MIS to, to surrender back a lease. But here we go, contradictions again. The legislation is not joined up. Case law says that a 54 Act renewal is a continuation, not a renewal. 
Bose Leon versus Green, 1961. But the MIS regulations say that lease renewal falls under MIS. And MIS regulations say in 2023 all passing lease agreements are captured by MIS. I think the answer to that is that the lawyers <laughs> are going to make a, have a field day out of this because there are so many contradictions because the legislation is not joined up because BASE didn't think about the system for, for monitoring compliance. How is capital value affected? Talked about that earlier. Scenario could be capital value <coughs> is zero. Could be. Don't see how that could be quite the case because there's always redevelopment value, but it could be impacted. Uh, what if the bank comes along and say, I want a revaluation? Are they going to say, I want to look at all the energy models? Well, I can tell you that that is happening. That is definitely happening. Banks are saying, I want to see the energy performance certificate, and if it's more than a couple of years old, it's worthless. And it is. They're right. EPCs more than two years old are utterly worthless. Valuations have to be done by the red book. Value there are some valuation surveyors here, are they? Yeah. So when you're doing a valuation now, given that the impact of MIS need to look at the energy performance certificate and the, and the building energy model and see if it is accurate and it is valid. Because you don't want any comebacks later on down the line if that is challenged. And um, going back to those lease clauses, there are some lease clauses that are looking to restrict tenants from getting a new EPC while they're in occupation because they don't want to get a worse one and then all of a sudden there all sorts of issues. But debt banks are asking for energy form certificates and dismissing them if they're more than a couple of years old. So, due diligence is going to have to improve and it's going to have to take into account the reliability of the energy model, implications of any uh, landlord and tenant law, um, and the lease terms. What do the lease terms um, say about um, MIS. Is there anything in it about MIS? It's not something that was, any performance it just didn't come on the horizon of, of, of valuers until, be, until MIS came along. It wasn't an issue, um, just wasn't one of the variables, but it is now. Will market adjust to MIS? Well, I can tell you from experience um, where it has occurred. Uh, a building in Harrogate that my clients were selling. Uh, one of the units in there, a restaurateur wanted it, um, but they couldn't let it to them because it was a G-rated. The problem was the conditioning system on the roof, further exasperated by the fact there was a listed building, and listed building consent hadn't been gained for the plant that was on the roof. So all sorts of issues then replacing that plant. The cost of doing that was £100,000. I sat, sat in a meeting with them and they said, we'll just take £100,000 off the price, straight away. Not even, just, just take it away. Don't want this. Another one in Scotland, uh, Section 63 compliance. Our assessor went round, said this bill oh, it doesn't comply with Section 63, you're going to have to make changes to it to get it to comply, uh, or an action plan, or, or, or you're going to have to have a display, display energy, um, monitoring energy. Cheapest way to get it through was to do an air pressure test, and the quote for that was £10,000. The client didn't want to have to do with that, just took £10,000 off the asking price. Problem came, it was sold, new purchasers came along, they got their assessor to do an assessment, it passed section 63. <laughs> Some big questions were then asked, why have we just taken 10 grand off if, if, if the next assessor, what it came down to was the fact that our assessment had been done in version 5.3 of SBEM as the base. Since we did the assessment, 5.4 came out, took into account more into account renewable energy on the grid, and, the cha and it had changed. The outputs had completely changed. And the two different assessors used different building dates. And we were able to show that the second assessor was giving a build date where the building wasn't identifiable on a resource called Old Maps. Have you come across Old Maps? Yeah. Well, this building wasn't there when... So there was a difference, or the building, I should say it's the other way around, the building was there prior to this assessor said it was built. So we were able to get out from under that for the, 
the program had changed and they put the building as being too young, which made a difference to all the U values uh, and was enough to make it compliant. So you have to be very careful. Um, and I know of other examples, but those are the ones that caused a lot of headaches. I had another one shopping centre in Guildford where one assessor came in and they're all C ratings and our assessor had given them all E. And I was asked, well, why is that? I said, well, the first thing I did, looked and I thought, hmm, let's see, run it through the new programme. All of a sudden, all our E's were D's, just because of the change, uh, because LED lighting was treated differently uh, in this new version. And I found evidence to say it had a water loop heat system, and the other assessor had said multi-splits. Um, so they were wrong, and we were right. So instead of uh, our client being very upset with us, they were thought, OK, that's all right now. I uh, had another one, actually, just yesterday, uh, which seems so long ago, I can't even remember what it's about, but it was interpretation of, of guidance and conventions. So my conclusions, how are we doing for time? My conclusions um, are that uh, EPCs have to be more accurate. You really have to make sure, when you get a building energy model commissioned, that the assessor knows what they're doing and has as much information as possible. The output from a, a building energy model in the EPC rating comes down to the quality of information that goes in. One of the big areas where you see uh, big improvements can be made is, is in lighting. The assessor comes in and unless they have the actual technical details of the, of, of the lamp itself in terms of what they call um, lamp efficacy, which is measured in something called lumens per circuit watt, sorry for being very technical, um, they just have to say what the lamp type is. So this one is a tungsten halogen, bad. <laughs> uh, and then, and then the model will assign to that a set value, uh, which is bad. Um, and so you see a lot of buildings, they have, this, they have these what they call default values. But if you can get the manufacturer spec, say that was an LED lamp, and you could get the box, and you could take on off the lamp lumens per circuit watt, then you can put that into the model. So this particular lamp, the way it works is this. Again, sorry, a bit technical. Is the reason LED, one of the reasons LEDs <coughs> model very well is because the light is direct, so it, all the light goes straight down because of the way it works. The lumens per circuit watt is much higher, so the lumens per circuit watt of this lamp here might be um, 25 lumens per circuit watt, whereas an LED lamp replacing that, you might expect 90, anywhere up to 125 lumens per circuit watt, but with a lighting output ratio of 1, so you get all the light. This lamp, as you know, the back is glass, so you get a certain amount of light going out, so you're probably only going to get 50% of the light from that lamp. So by changing the lighting and having the lighting data, you can massively improve the, the uh, EPC rating. And that's one of the ways that uh, improving the data uh, that you put into the model helps landlords uh, meet compliance. But if you get an assessor comes in really quickly, oh, they're tungsten, blah, 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 you're going to get a really poor rating. So you've got to make sure that they spend the time doing it, which inevitably means paying more can't rely on EPCs because, frankly, uh, if they precede the previous conventions, they can be completely inaccurate. Uh, the existing stock, we have a program where you put in, and we can, I can assess any build, building energy model for any building in the whole of the country, and I can see how accurate that building energy model is, because I can extract the data, because the data is available nationally. Uh, and there are, I see it all the time. You can see where the assumptions are, just default assumptions, default assumptions, just for the quickness and you change that data, get more information, it makes a big difference. Talked about APCs and valuation, um, lease terms, very important, especially dilapidations. Um, you know, are you going to end up, <laughs> you could have a scenario where the tenant, the tenant moves out of the building um, and says, well, I'll leave it as it is, but you have to pay me because if I take everything out that I've done, you can't let it. So what are you going to give me to move out? And the, tenant, the landlord's there thinking, oh, I'm going to get, you know, 
tens of thousands of pounds to refit this building and all of a sudden they're landed with a bill from the tenant saying, oh no, you're going to have to leave it like this because it's worthless to you otherwise. So landlords need to make sure that the lease is taken into account means as best they can. Um, and you need to keep up to date with revisions. Every, every revision to the legislation or energy prices need to think about those in the terms of the EPCs because energy price increases will affect. So for instance, uh, if you've got an air source heat pump um, and the electricity uh, costs go up, uh, or the gas, gas costs go up, that will affect the relationship of those renewable systems. It changes it. That's why, all the, that's why the exemption periods are very short. Uh, and the other thing I didn't cover on the exemption periods is when a property changes hand, the exemption is cancelled. You have to go through that whole process all over again. So you might have just done it a year later, sell it with a five-year exemption. That exemption ceases to exist when the property is sold. That's my company, um, and say we have software where we can look at all the building energy models um, and extract the data from it, and that's the end of that bit. So if you want to ask any questions, I'll see if I can answer them. Should, yeah. Um, the, the energy assessors, do they not have um, the software that updates itself? To yes, they do. The national calculation methodology, when they release a new version, it includes a conversion tool, so they can update that. But it's quite a long-winded process. You have to get your old model, put it into the conversion tool, and then... So we've got to constantly watch the changes to... Yeah, absolutely. You have to keep up to date with when new issues of, software of the software. Good. That's right. And usually what you find is, and I found out this week, they reduce in, you get a new version, and it's full of bugs, and it doesn't work, and then you have to wait for a fix to be a patch. <laughs> you have to do that. And I was spent a whole day trying to figure out why a um, I've been sent a model by a client, and they said, um, can you put this in your software to see what we need to do to make this building comply? And I spent all day trying to figure out why this model wouldn't open. I then went back to the, to the National Calculation Methodology website. Oh, there's a patch. Uploaded the patch, it all worked. So frustrating. <laughs> You know, it's the, the software is... Excuse me, what do you, what you mean by their model and the patch? Can you just well, that? yeah, the building energy model, the simplified building energy model, is a simple um, model where you put in details of the building fabric, both internal and external, the floors, the roof, all the conditioning systems, the lighting, uh, exhausts that are in toilets, and you put all that data in and it gives you an output. Yeah? When they release a new one, uh, just like um, with any software, it's full of bugs. And the reason, and it doesn't work. So then they have to issue a patch to fix those bugs. So it's the same if you, if you have um, a smartphone, when you get an update, it's like that. They have all these bugs in it. And then the software for building energy models is no difference. It's full of bugs all the time. So when they change the model, effectively you can get a new EPC without physically in the building? Uh, in retail, um, no, uh, within a certain time frame you could, yes, yes, as long as it's not too long ago. So there's a limitation usually about this, uh, 12 months in terms of when it's been assessed. But you, the, yes, you could, yeah. You could have a building um, which perhaps didn't comply uh, under one version and you put it through the new one and it does. You could do that. Um, it depends on how long ago it was surveyed. Yeah? Is, it, is this all driven by the EU and it going a bit on the 19th of March? <laughs> <laughs> I covered that slightly earlier. The answer to that is no, because it's all in UK legislation um, in, uh, under the Energy Companies Act 2011, so it's all covered in that. And given that the UK is the primary driver for the directive in the first place, like much of the EU legislation, the, U e the UK leads it most of it and wrote most of it, uh, it, won't, it won't go away because it is already in UK law. And you've got to remember is that we're bound by um, the Paris and Tokyo Accords. Uh, and it might surprise you to learn that um, The USA drives much of the new technology. They are absolutely red hot um, on improving 
uh, air, internal air quality, improving performance. Uh, they are really, really big on that, despite their president. <laughs> locally, they just don't care, and, and they are really hot on it. So no, it won't go out the window um, on the 29th of March. Are any patches on the way for the <laughs> um, don't know because uh, case law takes a long time to come through the courts, doesn't it? Um, there will undoubtedly be cases being. Because they're preemptive, because there's going to be chaos. Yeah, yeah, uh, you would think so, wouldn't you? But again, I've sat with base uh, and tried to to, uh, to to reason with them. People losing their money. Going to be no, they're not. They're going to be even less impressed when they tighten it up because they realise um, they need to meet the targets that we've agreed at Paris and other places. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's, it's classic government legislation. I was quite involved in Green Deal um, on the non-domestic side. What a farce that was. I mean, who was ever going to lend money against new, new systems? that you couldn't actually properly calculate how long it would take to repay. I mean, this is so theoretical. You can project that a system will, re will repay itself from the savings in a certain year, but it's based upon standard set of assumptions. The, the, the building energy model assumes occupancy of a certain time frame, from eight till six, and a certain number of people per space. Well, if you deviate from that, you totally change the output. Um, but that's one of the reasons we're exploring other softwares to monitor the use in real time so you get a better idea. If you, rely, if you think an EPC, like I said at the beginning, reflects energy performance, it doesn't. It's just a piece of paper with an asset rating so you can compare to one or the other. What it really is, is the government needed to measure, um, to form a baseline to measure the performance of buildings. So they, they got these EPCs, right, that's our baseline, if this, this, this is done, we can see how we can deviate from the baseline and then we've met our Paris Accord or Tokyo Accord or Kyoto, or whatever, whichever one you want to choose. So that's what it's there for. It's, an a, it's a database, and you can measure the potential impact. There's no doubt about it that certain things, uh, LED lighting or, or a good high-frequency fluorescent lighting system will save a lot of money. The, the, the paybacks are enormous. It's much less certain. Um, air source heat pumps, etc. much less certain. Um, also, they've got renewable heat incentives. So as they expire, yeah, um, that will change it. They're, then they will become much less viable. Yeah. Mhm. Mm Quite a shambles, isn't it? It is. Yeah, yeah sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> How often are the updates coming out? <laughs> and the molding any models? You used, well, you used to think they come out once a year, but there've been three this year already. Four, four. So. Yeah, they, keep, they have to keep updated because you get more and more, as you get more and more renewables into the grid, so as more and more turbines go up in Scotland, um, they have to keep changing. We're having, what did we have, four or five coal free days? So you have to, so grid electricity is the highest um, climate change emission fuel source because of the various different fuels that are used to generate grid electricity and also the transmission losses. One of the big things to work in America is, tra is power transmission through fiber optic cable, so there's almost no loss. We have wire. Anytime you produce heat, less efficiency. So the problem with our system, our, our electricity system's about 30% efficient, maybe. But that's still because you're creating steam, which is a very inefficient process, and, and transmission losses. Um, the Thatcher government put all these power stations in remote place, places next to rivers, miles away from where the power is wanted. <laughs> you lose a lot. Power, power stations really should be where the demand is, not miles and miles away, but obviously for aesthetic reasons and water demand. So, so an EPC, say, for this building, if it was done three years ago, would be long now today? It would. An EPC is, should be considered the same as a valuation. The valuation is as good until you've written it down and sent to the bank. Then it's, as soon as they've opened it, it's like buying a car, isn't it? A used car. Drive it off the lot, the warranty's expired. Mm -hmm. An EPC should never be considered any different. It's an asset rating of a snapshot in time. That's all it is. What's so significant? They could change it here. 
In here, the big, um, huge difference would be changing these lights to LED lights. And they've got the odd fluorescent here again, but they're, they're pretty awful. But these are all uh, tungsten lights. These are all tungsten lights in here, yeah. You get direct light, yeah, and the dimmable, all that sort of thing, but you know, it's very... Halogen. Halogen. Halogen lighting. What it, the reason they're inefficient is if you ever touch one, it's really hot, isn't it? So you, there's a huge amount of energy loss because of the heat and relative amount of light, and they fade, um, whereas an LED light, you get a much brighter rendition, um, and you have much less heat, um, and you get more direct light, so that's... A so, so the talent changes the wall, and they move out, so they can claim the cost the wall back, and uh, like that was. Maybe. It depends. But yeah, you would, in this, in this building, you've got all these lights on, do they all need to be even be on? <laughs> well, yes, yes, that's a, that's a different issue. Yes, they they do they do contribute to heat. Yes. Well, those changes spoke about will also reflect what EPC would run it as well without the change. Mies. Yeah, we don't like let's say that the EPC it changes. Yeah. Would it be the same for a domestic run as well? Um. Domestic is much less, um, the impact is less because it's a much simpler form of modelling. It doesn't take into account quite so much um, uh, the, the mechanical systems. Uh, but, but yeah, um, I mean obviously as you put more renewables on the grid you're going to change the impact of the systems and any electrical systems. So to a lesser extent, yes. I mean the big change on the domestic side has been with new build. In a new build now, um, you have to achieve a fabric energy efficiency and a mechanical energy efficiency of two targets to meet. Um, and it's really quite, um, quite complicated. But like I said, one of the ways you do it is uh, the joins of a building. You have a huge amount of heat loss. So you have something called the credited details. So you make sure that the, all the joins of the buildings are to the highest possible standard. Uh, and usually that might, that's probably enough to get you through. Um, and that depends on the quality of your assessor. When you see it go through a new housing state, see all this PV on the roofs, it's perhaps because the assessor hasn't actually thought about all the different things you could do in the model. But, you know, it depends. It might not always be the case, but every time I see PV on a new build, I think, hmm, that would be interesting to see how that was done. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay.